Hello, everyone um, who is joining us on Zoom or on Facebook Live, and welcome to this edition of Christine and Guests. Um, this time we're doing this uh, session in collaboration with Youth Climate Leaders, an organization who we very much support. Actually, Cassia is one of our TFF community members too. And today was the International Day of the Climate Professional. Um, and we were very happy to have TFF and some of our companies and innovators participating in various sessions throughout the day, culminating with this amazing experience to speak with Finian Makepeace who is part of the Kiss the Ground movement. In fact, the co-founder of Kiss the Ground, um, which is a nonprofit organization that has you know, really been um, spearheading regenerative agriculture and um, you know, kind of soil conservation practices and all based on this amazing documentary on Netflix and which we have uh, the pleasure to view via the link for all registrants. Um, so we're so excited to have you here. Where are you actually? You're in Los Angeles, right? I'm, I'm in Los Angeles uh, uh, um, in my bedroom because someone is working in our house today during COVID, you have to be safe. So I'm now in bedroom nice. lockdown. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to my bedroom. <laughs> and speaking from Tungva lands, uh, the Tungva people here in Los Angeles region. Very cool, very cool. I'm in Switzerland and Thought for Food, we have people all over the world who are involved in our movement and many Kiss the Ground enthusiasts. In fact, you may have heard and we will be showing this video recorded um, for a big uh, World Soil Day celebration that we're having in different parts of the world, kickstarting in Southeast Asia and Europe and also over in Brazil. Um, so we're really excited to be supporting the goals and ambitions of um, you know what you're doing Doing with your organization. So let's get started with that. And, you know, I like to joke and say, let's talk dirty. <laughs> I guess I'm not the first person to make that joke. <laughs> it's, it's never gets old. It's... It never gets old. Exactly. Yeah. But um, let's have some fun here. I mean, tell us a little bit about your affinity to soil. I mean, how does somebody from Los Angeles, you know, become obsessed with regenerative agriculture? And, you know, tell us about your journey into discovering this as a solution space and then deciding to create a movie and a nonprofit around it. Awesome, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I've been an activist most of my life. Uh, I would consider myself environmentalist, civil rights, many, many different aspects of activism. I would say I had a pretty hefty background in biology and soil science. So it didn't totally come out of the blue, but like, for example, uh, in 12th grade of high school, I'm from Ithaca, New York, upstate New York, okay. uh, where Cornell University it's is. Gorgeous so, there, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I was in 12th grade, for example, I was out doing soil samples uh, in helping with a, a Cornell study that they were finding out that I think it was oak groves were able to communicate and, and defend e themselves against airborne viruses by sending signals through mycorrhizal fungi uh, in the ground. And so not that I knew everything at all, and one iota of what I know now, but I had some background for this, especially heavy around biology. Um, so Fast forward to when I was about eight years ago, um, and I had kind of gone through a, a big life-changing moment where I had a dream, actually, where I was an old man and I was living in a refugee camp in Brazil because this climate change had gone so far as to shift the current of the Gulf Stream and an ice age basically came. And millions of billions of climate refugees, billions more dead. And it was just like chaotic times. And I'm living in this refugee camp and my granddaughter wakes me up in the middle of the night and she says, I found a hole in the fence and she sneaks me through the hole in the fence and the two of us walk throughout the night. And as the dawn approaches, we look over, we come over the crest of this hill and in front of us is a city. One of the cities is just completely destroyed. And uh, she looks up at me and she has tears streaming down her face. And she's just like, why did you let this happen? And she just is yelling at me as this old man. And that woke me up like nothing else I ever had because I had a moment of realizing that 
uh, it might go that far. It might be that intense and I would not have an answer for that little girl. And uh, lo and behold, about seven, eight months later, I, uh, my friend Ryland had come back from a, a conference in New Zealand. Um, people might know that the restaurant Cafe Gratitude, he's one of the founders of that. He had been at this conference watching a panel of scientists talk about can humanity sustain themselves on planet Earth? And the first five people said, no, based on our trajectory, we can't. And the sixth gentleman named Graham Sate said, what they said is true, but what's been left out or a big blind spot has been soil. And the, the fact that we can actually help regenerate it faster than we ever thought possible in agriculture in every ecosystem. So Ryland came back very excited. He's a very enthusiastic person. And he had known me as kind of his, his activist, environmental, political buddy. Um, and so he invited me, he invited Graham, first of all, to come to Los Angeles, audaciously like saying, hey, you got to come and talk to me and my friends. And so we kind of put on this event at a, at a little, uh, 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 what do you call it, auditorium or whatever. Graham talked to us for four hours. And to me, it was the most compelling argument that I felt blindsided by because it was like, how did I not know about this? As someone who had dedicated my life and really thought I knew what there was to know about where we're headed in terms of climate change, desertification, water security, I was kind of, you know, someone who nerded out about that shit. And so pardon me, I'm not supposed to. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, next so I, I had, uh, I had a moment of saying to myself, if I didn't know about this, probably most people in the world just don't know about this opportunity. And that night we went back to Ryland's house and we had a moment of basically shaking hands saying, if this is true, we have to dedicate our lives to getting the word out because this is the biggest news for humanity to partake in, to avert the coming catastrophe that we're all headed towards. So it was kind of a, for me, it was within a seven hour period, I dedicated my life to this work or at least what I thought would be help start the momentum and then get back to my career or, you know, have it be a little part of my life. So yeah, it kind of blindsided me and, and, and took over. And then inevitably it has now become everything that I'm about because the opportunity just gets more and more immense and more practical and more economically viable and more um, fully integrated into every aspect of human culture uh, that's possible right now. So that's my journey and, and it's been incredible. Yeah. What I love about kind of what you've just shared with us is that you didn't have all the answers. You just were inspired by a solution that somebody like showed you and said, I need to get spread the word so that people who can come up with the answers and the solutions can hear about this and put their you know minds towards solving this. So it was a great way for you to like build a platform, right? That could catalyze like a ripple effect around the world. And I would love to know like what caused you to take this like idea, this inspiration, that you heard and say, let's make a movie and get Woody Harrelson and Giselle Bundchen and, you know, some really cool farmers named Ray, you know, to show us like, to tell this story. Like, how did that happen? Great question. And just to clarify, I've studied my butt off, which I encourage everyone to do, but still, I don't know if people have seen that, that uh, how movements start little video on YouTube where there's a guy dancing on a hill at a festival. It's like crazy okay. hippie dude dancing on the hill without a shirt on at a festival. And he's doing his stuff. No one else is dancing. Everyone else is sitting down. And this younger uh, Asian gentleman gets up and starts dancing with him. And what the video is really trying to have people grasp is that we can't go anywhere without the leaders, without the indigenous knowledge holders, without the, you know, holistic practitioners who are learning how we can manage land uh, effectively anywhere in, in region by region. And then this cutting edge science that we're learning about, you know, discovering of Gomalan in 1994 of like what it actually does and where it comes from, from mycorrhizal fungi. Um, we need all three of those. And those are from people who have taken leadership. They're living in that world, doing the research, doing the trials, living on the land, uh, getting the concepts 
no one's hearing about it. So the importance of that second person or third person is that they're playing the role as the support so that this idea becomes available for the world. So from the get-go, we knew that our role was the second person to help mm -hmm. this movement get out there. And so the emergence of the film about a year and a half after we kind of initiated the organization, um, we, we got to talk with Josh and Rebecca Tekel, the directors of the film. Ryland was very persistent saying, you guys got to make a movie about this. And our other friend, John Rulak was also in their ear about, you guys got to do a movie about this. It's becoming new, big, big idea. And they were like, what? And then we started sharing them the science about it and getting them to understand. And slowly but surely they were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So that was an effort that we collaborated with them uh, and really who, who were going to be these key people. And Ryland had a relationship already with Woody. And we had, a, we had been cultivating these relationships with these leaders, uh, particularly leaders in the movement. And uh, lo and behold, the film took longer than expected, but it finally was uh, able to be finished. And it, it is a part of the movement. It doesn't represent the entire movement whatsoever. There's a bunch of indigenous voices left out. There's a bunch of things that are not in that film. So we really want to be clear that it's a part of the story right now. It's not the story, and, uh, but we're proud of it. And we're proud that it's getting out in the world in a massive way. Yeah. So can you tell us more about like some of the big messages that you would like to relay to young innovators around the world about soil and how it relates to diet, to health, to climate change? Some of those like aha moments that can, you know, really inspire people. Yeah, I think one of the probably most easily accessible ones I'll start with, because a lot of people's minds around climate right now and mm -hmm. One of the line, it's in the film, the lines in the film is, you know, carbon's not the enemy, right? We've, we've essentially put carbon in this perspective of, oh no, carbon's bad, it's creating issues. But framing carbon as the source of everything alive is a really good place to start. Where does the plant come from? Seriously, I was asking. <laughs> Oh. The plant is built, <laughs> not just some mess with you. The plant is built from thin air. It has water in it, but the structure of this plant comes from the stuff that we refer to as nothing mm -hmm. air. Air has carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. The plant performs photosynthesis, it pulls carbon dioxide into its stomata sunlight energy breaks that carbon off, connects, connects it with hydrogen and oxygen from water, H2O, that it's pulling up from the ground to create carbo, uh, glucose molecules that are then diluted in water to create sugar water. That sugar water goes throughout the plant to, to build it. Those carbon molecules are what build the actual structure. So we've gotten now that the carbon in the atmosphere builds the plant right? The air builds the plant. Now, what we didn't know, Christine, is the, the amount of that liquid sugar that was dripped or exuded out of the roots of the plant. So this is the big news, is that soil is built from thin air too, on a direct drip line from plants. So plants are putting 30 to 40% of the liquid sugar that they create from photosynthesis, they're dripping out of their roots. Why? To feed microbes in the soil, like fungi and bacteria in the whole soil food web. Those microbes are responsible for making minerals available to the plant, as well as making water more accessible to the plant. So if, if a magnesium is here, it might take a certain bacteria molecule to make that magnesium in a plant available form. So therefore it behooves the plant to feed sugars to those microbes, create ginormity of populations of microbes who are harvesting those minerals, making them plant available so the plant can be healthy and strong and defend itself. It's also connecting with mycorrhizal fungi that are out harvesting water and pumping it back. This is a feed so that you can be fed symbiotic relationship. But the crux of it is it's carbon, pumping out carbon sugar the, plant, the organisms eat the carbon sugar, they're therefore built from carbon as well. They create sticky uh, substances like glomalin and all these other substances that aggregate soil together, 
making clusters of stuck together soil that's spongy. And that's what holds water that creates space for habitat, for air, nitrogen filled air to move through. That's the soil system. So for people to just get a glimpse to when we work with nature to maximize photosynthesis, to pump carbon into the ground, to build structure carbon filled soil, we are regenerating land's ability to function and increasing its ability to hold life over time. Mm -hmm. So farming, while we're producing food, we can be increasing the land's ability to hold water, create biomass, feed animals, uh, 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 sequester carbon. All of that can be happening because we're regenerating land, uh, building it back up. So that's the big, that's the big idea of we used to think soil was just built from things falling to the surface, decomposing and mixing with the sand, silt and clay. That makes up a 10, sometimes 15% of what makes up soil. But the big news was under the ground, how much the roots were pumping out the soil. That's the big news that we didn't really know, which makes this idea so big and fundamental. So I'll stop so, there and then we can get into what that means for everything from human health to farmer prosperity or all that kind of stuff. I do want to get to that, but I would like to ask really quick, what have we done to break that relationship? Is it just industrial agriculture and, you we know, don't monoculture? care about it. First, yeah. first of all, we don't care about it. In many cases, we don't know that it's happening. So mm -hmm. um, when you do big agriculture, you're inevitably having the harmful or degenerative practices on more space. Mm -hmm. Many cultures around the world have been regenerative. Most cultures around the world, their agricultural systems have been degenerative. They just weren't doing it at an, on enough acres for enough time that uh, nature wasn't regenerating faster than they were de degrading it. But countless civilizations across the world would increase their size of their civilization. They'd use up all of the tree canopy. They'd reduce their soil layer because of erosion. And mm -hmm. then their population would plummet and nature would regenerate back. What we've done now across the globe is that we're propping it up with chemicals. So we just keep on farming these vast acres, leaving land bare, no carbon's being pumped in, tilling the land, breaking up all those aggregates so they're more vulnerable to erosion, uh, using pesticides and fertilizers, killing all the life that's, that's helping the biodiversity from birds and bees and worms, et cetera to exist. So we're, we're doing perpetual degeneration on vast scale, which is making the world turn to desert at 30 million acres a year. And there's just not time for it to replenish itself. Not time that. for it to regenerate. And, mm -hmm. and that's where the promise with regenerative agriculture is while we're farming every year, we can be regenerating the land. And that's different than the, the majority of the context around the world uh, for cultures that were in farming. Now, not to say many indigenous cultures from Australia to parts of the United States were actively doing farming or agriculture that was helping the landscape increase its function and ability. So many indigenous cultures need to be uh, uh, brought into how they were doing this uh, for populations for, for thousands of years. And I like what you said at the outset too, that there's this chance to marry like scientific knowledge now with kind of like practices that have been known for centuries. And now we can like base that on a deeper understanding of, you know, why it's working in this way and not just what we thought was happening was, you know, kind of leaves degrading in the soil and, you know, adding nutrients. There's so much more complexity and, you know, symbiotic relationships happening, um, you know, at our feet. And, and, yeah. and one more thing on that is, a lot of indigenous wisdom is missing. And we have to take seriously how degraded landscapes are right now. So this is where the combination of those three is really important for me because people are very rightfully sounding the alarm bells of like indigenous knowledge has been erased and not utilized. We have to you know, pay attention to many of these indigenously based indigenous cultures, regeneratively based, pardon me, indigenous cultures. Uh, as, as a very stewardship model. But part of it is also like land that's never been desertified is desertified right now. So California mm -hmm. is dehydrated and desertified. It used to have a marsh that was hundreds of miles long in the center of what's now the Central Valley. 
that used to be very moist land. So we're dealing with heavily degraded down to 1% soil organic matter land that has to be looked at as how are we going to how are we going to regenerate that it's not just going to magically be what it was if we leave it to rest or we let Nate you know no that land has to be managed by humans right now to help it get out of its sickness to prop it back up so it can start to be self-perpetuatingly regenerative anyway um yeah so well, in your there's there's talk, taking yeah. seriously the conditions we're already in yeah, and I mean, in your talk, TED Talk, you talk about the difference between sustainability and regenerative ability. Am I saying that correctly? Regenerative ability. And I would love it if you could just like, again, explain to everyone who's watching like what you see as the difference um, there and what we need to be striving for in regeneration versus sustainability, which has been kind of the du jour word, right, for environmentalists to date. Yeah, um, homework for tonight go on to Google Earth and check out the world. It's really sad. If you look at how much land is in agriculture or was in agriculture that looks degraded, mm -hmm. you will get a very, very potent understanding that sustaining anything right now is kind of insane. Yeah. We're so far degraded. 75% of land is degraded right now. Mm -hmm. So why would we want to even talk about sustaining? That's just crazy for future generations. So when we talk about, you know, regeneration, we're saying, look, 10,000 years, and then of course the last 500 years and 250 years have been exponentially more, but we've been degenerating. So we're down here at this little red mark we call, you are here, 10,000 years of degeneration. Yeah. Sustaining it means that that's the situation, food aid, wa no water sovereignty. Uh, that's what we're going to perpetuate with the, the current scenario with how much of the forest and how much grassland is desert. No, we're saying regenerate and then we can start to sustain. But we have to take seriously the dire need of regeneration. And in symbols, what's been really helpful for me as an advocate, sustainability is really kind of that, that idea you see in the circle, put back what you take out. But that only works if everything's perfect. Regeneration is kind of a spiral that starts from a diminished state and is ever increasing at the same time as branching out as it goes on. But it's, it's this spiral thought of like, we have to start from a diminished state, which we're at right now and regenerate. So those are kind of the differences. Ah, I see that we have Jorge from Mexico who's saying hello. Hi, Jorge. And we also have um, Adir Bijebi from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. And he's actually shared his song Keepers of the Earth on YouTube, um, which is, we've, I've actually watched that before. Um, you've shared that before. And I think that's something, Finian, you might enjoy given your also background in music, which is very interesting. And as I was mentioning to you at the outset of the call, we at TFF love bringing different disciplines and creative creatives together with scientists and you know traditional together with new to create things that are better than ever before. So um, we always love when people are sharing their you know um, poetry and songs and things that really also inspire and activate uh, you know in new mindsets um, about being coming solution developers. I love that. And Christine, I think it's of the utmost importance that we talk about this because advocacy is so crucial right now. And everything from connecting the dots, so to speak, or to, you know, bringing new people into the conversation who, who you have access to. One thing I want to put out there, well, two things I want to focus on for a second. Art is essential, right? But sometimes we as artists think of our role as just making art, making a song, making a painting. Well, what I'm encouraging is to say also, that's important. It's crucial for movements to be successful. Every movement has had that element. But what I want to invite today is that the artists or people who are outside of science or farming or agricultural soil or whatever, politics, 
that you understand that your abilities and your view of the world and how your brain thinks is different than someone who's in those particular niche areas. And it's crucial that you understand as a movement is building and trying to become accessible to the entire world, that to make it function and be big and, 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 and omnipotent, it has to have people like you who are creatives in this, inserting their abilities, not just on making art, but on thinking about the whole thing, being a part of it, doing uh, projects, creating connections with farmers of this. The way different humans think is amazing to me to think about how an ecosystem, a functioning ecosystem of a movement is to be successful. And that's where I invite people is like, look, you don't just have to do what you're doing in your art. We might need you as an artist to get your chops at policy or activism up. Like that might be what we need you to do now. So that's why the reason I created the Soil Advocate Training Course is so that people anywhere from any walk of life can say, I can actually play a very contributing role to this. And I don't just need to stay in the confines of where I currently am. That's great, do that too. But look at your ability to jump in and say, how come no one's thinking about this like this? Well, mm -hmm. maybe they just don't. Maybe that's why they need you to come and help think and, and think outside the box and create different options, look at different audiences they've never tackled before who, or who they're afraid of tackling you have, or I'm speaking to you or anyone on this call has yeah. that ability to actualize that. So I need to address the elephant in the room um, because I have a feeling that you're, you know, a little bit of a hippie as am I, as is kind of everyone in the TFF, at least they're open-minded, right? To all of these kind of like experiences and ideas and art and culture and, you know, kind of how we can, you know, be progressive, right, in solving the challenges our planet, planet faces. But I'm sure that you must, especially being based in, you know, the U.S. with big production farmers, you must come up against people saying, okay, take your hippie idea. It's never going to feed the world. It's never going to be productive. How, what do you say? What's the answer that you have there? Great question. Uh, what I teach in Soil Advocate Training is that you might not be the one to reach a certain audience, but that does not mean you're not playing ball in that game or that particular uh, endeavor or, or group that you're trying to court or coordinate with. Mm -hmm. I think connecting to people who are diverse in who and how they're able to communicate is super important. That's why this movement is so amazing is talk about different sides of the aisle, different spectrums of the yeah. US demographic that's in the regenerative agriculture movement. It's pretty extraordinary. I mean, yeah, I was raised a pretty profound activist hippie liberal, <laughs> but I'm working with people who couldn't be seen as um, yeah. different. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty wide spectrum. So what I'm yeah. saying is if, if I'm trying to connect to a certain group, um, I might not be the one who should connect with them. I might be able to help get funding. I might be able to help get a space where they're coming together. I might be able to help do things, but I don't have to be the one interfacing directly trying to convince my conservative uncle to move into regenerative <laughs> agriculture. It's probably better if my conservative uncle watches a video that's on Netflix that has Gabe Brown on the cover of it. Uh, and I don't have to be the bearer of that because I'm then going to be butting heads with his right. peer evidence of what he thinks versus mine. It's like, even though I might know a boatload more than he does around soil science, he and I might be like, well, I think this. Yeah. And I think it's really like, just, hey, how about you just watch that film on Netflix that right. has really uh, prominent um, conservative or, or what you'd consider conservative mm -hmm. farmers talking about the same idea. Uh, let, let the tools and do the work. Let the tools do the work. And saying that yeah. they can be productive too. This isn't like, there isn't yeah. the trade off that is right, and that's what we talk about economically viable these kind of yeah. arguments and we, we work on them of like how do you get people if you know that they're listening is going to be asking well how's it how's it work economically if you know that start with that why would yeah. you wait to to 
talk to that audience. So catering to your audience is super crucial. If you can't do it, use the, the media tools or use the people or work with them to get these ideas across. It's, it's a collaborative effort. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. And in that vein of kind of like- And one, one last, one last thing, one last, sorry, one last thing is super no, important on this, is how you come across is super important. Yeah. I've talked with many people who other people like, oh, you're, you're a hippie from musician from Los Angeles. You'll never <laughs> be able to talk to these people. A lot of times it's, it's your why. It's about making your message, like finding ways to depolarize the discussion. Maybe sometimes it's about having other people lead when advocating. I think that's a message around all types of topics in agriculture. There's so much nuance in the debate and so many different like ideas and experiences, which leads to a question we just got in the audience from my friend Kim. Um, and she is asking about can you accelerate regeneration of degraded land by adding animals into the rotation? For example, a traditional food crop rotation with an extra season where the land is planted yeah. with forage and be grazed. Um, I've been told it's part of the indigenous knowledge base that we've lost. So this, I love this question because you know animal agriculture is extremely contentious right now in the world. And um, I've been privy and part of many debates that have uh, kind of devolved into, you know, fighting and entrenched positions around this topic about what is the future of protein, are animals part of the equation? So I'd love to hear your perspective about their role potentially in regenerative agricultural practices. Yeah, context, context, context. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of the, the mantra in regenerative agriculture. Um, so in terms of the, the animal debate, I'll try to sum it up quick here, is one third of the earth is naturally grasslands. Grasslands essentially evolved with uh, roaming uh, herds of herbivores or animals that look like cows or bison or whatnot. Um, to restore those ecosystems, those prairie ecosystems, we have to have animals, ruminants on them. Otherwise they don't come back as deep rooted perennial grass systems as they were uh, evolved to be with the conditions. So Remembering climate plays a part. When I say climate, I mean how much rainfall, how much moisture throughout the year, whether it's a brittle or, or non-brittle environment. Our, our current option is to allow for regenerative grazing versus degenerative grazing on our land to restore those ecosystems. So that's where it's kind of like, well, regeneration is necessary. Animals are necessary for regeneration. Um, in other regions, you know, agroforestry systems make complete sense as the main uh, regenerative forests. In other situations, it's silvopasture where you're doing a combination. So depending on what's called for in the context, that's what I think we should pay more attention to than whether animals are bad or not. It's not the cow, it's the how, as they say. And it's really about, it's not, you know, for example, it's not carrots aren't bad, but organic carrots grown in the Central Valley on, you know, 1500 acres, that's bad. Not the what, but the how. Context, context, context. I love that. I even just recently read a study that said, you know, there's a lot of people who say plant trees, but it's not as simple as planting trees. Like you said, in ecosystems that are plains based, it's actually worse to plant trees and implement like agroforestry systems um, than it would be, for example, to bring back. Well, you just might be fighting, you might be fighting a losing battle. You might be fighting a losing battle yeah. that is inevitably going to have those trees die if you don't repair the conditions of the ground such that they're, that that's possible. And that's where, you know, in, in terms of grassland for people to understand, grassland systems aggregate soil and make a soil sponge like nobody's business. They're designed that way so that they can withstand long periods of drought and maintain soil moisture at huge depths with their roots. That's how they evolved so that they could handle long periods of very, very dry climate. Yeah. So I have a very like detailed question, but I think it's a fascinating one. Catherine is asking about kind of the um, impact of the film. So she says, Netflix is a fascinating forum for disseminating this information. What has been the reaction to the film? Any chance that they have insight into the geography of the audience, e.g. have lots of people watch this in the US Corn Belt? Have you heard from any newly convinced region converts? Conversely, have you heard from any skeptics? If so, thoughts on convincing the skeptics? Curious to hear about overall reactions. 
Yeah, it's uh, overwhelmingly, it's been exceptional. Uh, we were surprised that we ended up trending on Netflix, which I don't know if everyone knows, but once you're trending on Netflix, that means you're on everyone's homepage in Netflix for a week or two. And that changes everything. That's the game changer where it exponentially grows. So all of a sudden, uh, farmers and the like who are, you know, heard about this vaguely or ranchers have heard about it vaguely. Um, we've had a lot, and I mean a lot of conversion talking with the Soil Health Academy, who some of the stars of the film, um, they're just overwhelmed with the positive response from farmers who are like, yeah, I guess I kind of see the point here, finally, you know, and fam tons of people whose family members are farmers being like, God, oh, fine, or parents, you know, dads and moms, they're like, oh, you're crazy, you're crazy. And then they watch the film and they're like, oh, this is great. We want to do cover crops next year. Um, so profound impact. Some of the some of the areas like India, the Kiss the Ground uh, India was trending on Twitter for four days or something as one of the top five positions on Twitter. And then like the film is was crazy in India. So some surprises like that of like, uh india phenomenon uh, going really really well and uh, yeah it's it's been exceptional yeah no it's interesting i i mean it would like i said we could have a whole other session because there's like some new companies entering into the particularly the plant-based meat market that are focused on leveraging agrobiodiversity and integrating regenerative you know um, non-monoculture based um, agricultural production practices and inclusive and circular business models. And I can point you in the direction of a couple of companies doing this, which is really fascinating, but yeah. I hear you on the kind of like more processed output. And I think there could be, like I said, a whole other, you know, interesting um, and context, context, context-based discussion around this. Um, exactly. And that's where, that's where I just, the same thing, you get both sides of this argument uh, yeah. making black and white statements. And I'm guessing you would have the same gripe or concern, I should say, around like urban agriculture and indoor growing. Not necessarily urban agriculture and not necessarily indoor growing. Um, okay. The inputs again on that are really important to pay attention to um, and the connection with the land, et cetera. But there are some things where when we look at lettuce production, Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, how much water is in lettuce? It's like 98% water. I don't, right. don't quote me on the number, but it's yeah. mostly Mainly water. water. Yeah. Um, so if we ship lettuce in plastic containers around the world, we're essentially shipping water. Absolutely. So the closer to source mm -hmm. to eating it that we can have lettuce, the best thing is that people grow leafy vegetables in their home gardens. Now right. it's easier said than done because lettuce bolts really quickly and it's annoying because it's gone after three weeks if you don't manage it well. I, I'm a proponent of people thinking holistically about this of like, are we seriously shipping around water? Mm -hmm. uh, that's crazy. Okay, let's address that. Um, so it's again, it's if hydro aquaponics uh, can be a reality in localized areas, or we can have uh, more production of those type of grains in central city locations. Like if you look at Cuba, they're kicking butt, they're kicking our butt. Talk about communism kicking capitalism's butt. Localized agriculture is- uh, Just to win over those and corn belt <laughs> farmers. <laughs> there you go. Either but you really, there. I mean, if you look at Iowa right now, yeah, Iowa is 85% ag land. They're importing 90% of their food. 85% of the land in Iowa is in farming and they import 90% of their food. So yeah. yes, communism is kicking, kicking capitalism's ass when it comes to food sovereignty and food deserts, even in rural land. You know, yeah. that's the reality. We're eating yeah. processed food that's giving us cancer. And is capitalism winning? No, we're killing ourselves. I'm not yeah. promoting that we should be communists. I'm saying that like I know. <laughs> food access portion, yeah. when we talk about healthy organic food accessible to local regions, we're losing in a big way in the United States. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, we, I want to have like 10 more sessions with you because we at Thought for Food are working with a lot of really cool organizations, indeed trying to solve this food sovereignty and food security issue on in the US, right? Usually we think about food security as something, you know, in other markets, 
um, you know, where there's like widespread hunger. And this actually is happening in the US too. And there's a really interesting organization in Atlanta that's focused on combating urban, you know, food deserts and, you know, bringing um, innovative thinkers and urban planners and architects all together to kind of redesign how humans live with food at the center of it. So lots to discuss there. But um, I want to talk just in the last few minutes that we have about the organization, the nonprofit, right, and what you're doing there um, in terms of like continuing to build this movement and spread the word. And what are the next steps after, is there going to be a kiss the ground too? <laughs> um, what, yeah, what's happening? Uh, so kiss the ground, the nonprofit has really been in awareness spreading from day one and connecting people to this movement. Uh, that, that continues with our, our media and our outreach and, and inviting people in. With the, with the launch of the film, um, we kind of looked at, at the shape of a funnel where we're saying, oh, pardon me, funnel people in through the film. And the first belt of that funnel is really uh, something called the find your path tool where we don't think by any stretch that Kiss the Ground can handle or should handle the huge influx of people that want to find what to do, how to get involved in this movement. So that find your path tool is just quick tile hitting of your interest, where you are, what your background is to find out what we should recommend that you, Christine, or anyone else, anyone being able to access this, this information, become equipped to confidently talk about it, spread the message, and take on projects, lead initiatives. That's soil advocate training. It's one of our flagship courses. We also have things like gardening uh, for regenerative gardening coming and like these more hands-on practical things. But soil advocate training is kind of the flagship course of here, take all these assets, take all these slide decks, take these talking points, utilize them, learn how to be an advocate and then go do your kick butt things. Mm -hmm. The other side is farmers and farmland. So we're dedicated to training farmers from around the world, uh, but really focused first and foremost in the United States, giving them access to cutting edge training, the best regenerative agriculture training in the world. How do we make that accessible to them at scale? And the and film, we'll, there might be a series that comes out with the film to follow up, uh, but we have a lot of other media things coming out. We have a lot of big initiatives coming where people can get involved. Uh, but the first thing I would say is to do the find your path tool, start taking soil advocate training, connect to our community, um, so that you're able to interact with everyone who's on the front of this move. Mm -hmm. And what scale farmers do you find that are signing up for the courses? Are, is it all size farmers? Yeah, I mean, through Kiss the Ground, uh, we have a pretty wide diversity. People who are going right through Soil Health Academy, some of the stars of the film, for example, they're dealing with more um, kind of what you look at as common agriculture in the United States. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we have a pretty diverse range. Uh, a lot of new farmers. We were really surprised at the analytics of how many brand new farmers that we were getting who were interested in the farmer training courses. Mm -hmm. Well, you might be excited to know in the event that we have planned for World Soil Day in Southeast Asia, they're doing a find the local ray challenge. They wanna find who are the rays that are living in Malaysia and Amazing. Thailand. So we'll share that back with you um, and, you know, maybe they can uh, connect with you at some stage. That's but. so great because we're, we're expanding our training. So we're going to be doing several courses. We're doing an Indian course on smallholder farmers in India. And we have a gentleman who's been training farmers on economically viable transitions to no-till or organic regenerative farming uh, yes. who are currently in very heavy chemical-based agriculture. A lot of them yeah. struggling with that model. So yeah, we're wanting to find other areas around the world where those those rays are who we can do courses with to scale up the access to training for sure. It's been a common thread in the conversation around the need for you know context and nuance and that there aren't easy answers here. And we definitely have to be open-minded um, to look at the like big picture and the long-term game and you know how we can like minimize trade-offs in this, you know. So for journey. example, if 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 roller crimpers stay with Rodale and regenerative organic only, the innovation right. on roller crimpers is gonna suck. But if we scale out roller crimpers to making it a, a, a viable market for people because no-till is a serious option and glyphosate's obviously gonna get, people know there's a time limit on glyphosate and they know it gets less effective as time goes on. Farmers already know this. 
and they know it's going to be banned soon. So that means if we allow this market to emerge for really good roller crimpers, we're pushing innovation in, in that same kind of thinking. So I know it's bad. I know glyphosate is, is the devil right now, but it's also what's, what's the trajectory and where are we being serious about what's currently happening and how are we going to get farmers moving in the direction of soil health and understanding the repercussions of using glyphosate, not just on their farm, but their bottom line, their dollar, everything. Yeah, fascinating. Well, thank you so much for spending this time today. I think, um, you know, this is, like I said, a documentary that has inspired so many people of the youth climate leaders uh, movement and of the thought for food movement. There's a great synergy between our organizations um, in trying to create more innovation for more positive impact in more places. And it's great to have somebody, you know, who has an amazing platform join us, share your lessons and experiences, and we hope to continue to, you know, work with you and champion um, the, the cause of soil. You know, the solution is under our feet, like you say, and it's uh, time to tap into its potential. So thank you again on behalf yeah, of all of us. Yeah. Of course. The last thing I want to say is there's a place for everyone, whether you're worried about water, whether you're worried about food access, whether you're worried about human health, whether you're worried about farmer prosperity, whether you're worried about climate and carbon sequestration or biodiversity or human connection to earth or whatever it is, this movement has a space for you to lead and, and contribute in a big way too. So we invite everyone to roll up their sleeves and get involved because time is of the essence really. All right, and regeneration is possible. Yeah, yeah together we can do this. We can Thank do Thank you that. so much for having me. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone, but I think we got the, you know, message and yeah, peace. Thanks a lot. It was great to meet you. you. Bye. You Bye.